Dr. David, first of all, let me tell you what a privilege and a blessing it is for us to be able to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Very grateful to be in Argentina. You're enjoying Argentina? Very much. You've never been here before? It's my first time here, and I have been received with great warmth, and I'm enjoying my stay very much. Wonderful. You deserve no less. I'd like to start our talk um, by asking you about something that, that especially moves me about your work, which is that even though you're a great believer and you're speaking about spirituality, you seem to always be addressing everyone, not just believers. Is that true? Yes, because I think when it comes to spirituality, uh, it's something for all human beings. Uh, we are made to be spiritual beings. To be spiritual means to be fully alive. And that is what every human being wants, not only believers. So to you, belief, uh, well, you speak more about faith than about belief, if, if I'm correct. Right. Faith is trust in life. And uh, every human being has trust in life, uh, whether we are fully aware of it or not. But by breathing in, we're trusting that there is something to breathe in, just our breathing is expressing that relationship to life that uh, is ultimately trust. And if you fully live it and fully entrust yourself to life, then that is called faith. That it goes, <coughs> it's your trust, your courageous trust in life and in the source of life. And those who use the word God call the source of life God. So to you, faith doesn't necessarily imply um, the existence of a God? Uh, as there a is supernatural no question being. about the existence of God. Every human being is related to that mystery. We do not, it's total mystery where we come from, where we go to, what makes us alive. Nobody knows. Science can explain how it works, but cannot explain what it, life is. It is total mystery, and that mystery is something which some people call God, others do not call it God. Uh, so it's not a question of believing in God. Everybody trusts in life, otherwise we wouldn't be alive. It's just a matter whether we use the word God or not. And I am one who uses the word God very carefully because it leads to so many misunderstandings. Mm. In, in that sense, when we we spoke earlier about your idea of mysticism. I'd like to go back to that a little bit. When you spoke about every person being a special kind of mystic, what, what exactly did you mean by that? Uh, it means that psychology can show that uh, to the extent to which one can generalize, uh, every human being has experiences of communion with the ultimate, uh, moments in which we are perfectly happy because we feel totally at home in the universe. And those moments are mystic moments. But the people whom we greatly admire, very creative people, very resilient people, and the mystics, the known mystics in history, uh, they make something out of these moments. They allow these, the experience of communion with the ultimate to inform their life, to flow into their life, to live out of this experience. And that is the task that for all of us, but uh, some of us are not as good at it as others. <laughs> do, you think, do you think it's possible to live from that place all the time? Uh, there are some people who live from this awareness of uh, being confronted with ultimate mystery uh, most of the time, I would think, for instance, uh, the Dalai Lama, when one is in his presence, one feels that he is uh, very transparent towards that mystic presence. Uh, to what extent this is all the time, I, can, I can't tell. And from, I gather from your books that you think selflessness has a lot to do with achieving that state. Uh, selfness, selflessness means really egolessness. Uh, the self is that which unites all of us. When we go back into ourself, we can watch ourselves. I can watch myself sitting here now. You can watch yourself. Each one of us can watch ourselves. So 
the, the, are there two of us? Well, it's one, uh, but it's the, the watcher when you go by, further and further back, you come to the watcher whom nobody can watch, and that is the self. And that is one for all of us. We, we, we know that. It cannot be divided, it's just one. Uh, but when, then we come to our bodies, and our bodies are very different from one another. So uh, I, myself, the I is sort of the body and the self is that which all of us share. And selflessness means uh, that you are not caught in your body, uh, caught in your separateness, because that is the ego. When you think that this, this little me that is uh, encapsulated in this body is the center of the, of the world, and then you are afraid of all the other me's, and then all of a sudden you get fearful, and out of this fear come all the bad things. So selflessness is really egolessness. It means uh, openness for that great self that we all share. And how do you think one goes about cultivating that kind of selflessness? Is it through spiritual practice alone? Uh, I have found that the easiest way uh, for most people is to cultivate s spirituality or selflessness uh, or coming alive through grateful living. And, uh, Gratefulness uh, arises in our hearts whenever um, we, we realize that something is a pure gift that is really given, it's not bought or uh, earned, but it's pure gift and is valuable. Uh, then we spontaneously become grateful. And uh, then we can realize that every moment is such a gift because there's nothing we can do to bring about this present moment. It's a pure gift, uh, and it is the most valuable thing that we can imagine, because everything else that we can do uh, is possible only because we have this present moment. It is uh, the essence of all opportunities. And so we are grateful at every moment. We can live gratefully at every moment for the gift for the opportunity that is given to us, uh, moment by moment. And that makes us truly happy. We know that the happy people are the grateful ones. We always think the other way around. We think that uh, people who are, who are happy are grateful for being happy. But we do know people who have everything one needs and more, and still they are not happy because they are not grateful. And then we know other people who have uh, great misfortune and, and we wouldn't like to share with them, and yet they radiate joy because they are grateful, uh, and, and therefore they are joyful. Joy is that happiness that doesn't depend on what happens. And some people uh, live gratefully, and all of us could li live gratefully and have that joy. That doesn't mean that you can be grateful for everything. There are many things for, for which we cannot be grateful uh, for. War and uh, acid rain and exploitation of the environment and oppression and exploitation and uh, per on the personal level for infidelity and uh, betrayal and loss of friends. And many things for which we cannot be grateful. But in every moment in which you are confronted even with something that is very painful, you can still be grateful for the opportunity that is given to you. And it's uh, the opportunity to learn, opportunity to grow, uh, often the opportunity to protest, the opportunity to ask questions. And good questions can really change the world. They have a great deal of leverage. So uh, at every moment, we can be grateful for the opportunity. And most of the time, the opportunity is just an opportunity to enjoy. We, we overlook that, but when we begin to live gratefully, we see how much uh, joy there is in our lives, just the gift of being able to breathe, to, to see with our eyes, to listen, to smell, to touch. We come alive and we are grateful. And, and that is true spirituality, because spiritus 
means life breath and spirituality means aliveness on all levels. Aliveness, that's beautiful. Uh, we do know that some people are naturally more grateful than others. Do you personally believe that gratefulness or gratitude can be taught and developed in people? Yes, I think uh, gratefulness is something that can be easily taught and practiced. Uh, and there is a, a, a method, a little method, that you can even teach children to practice gratefulness. And it's simply the three words, stop, look, go. Uh, if, you, if you don't stop, you will just automatically rush through life and you will not be able to appreciate anything uh, because you will not be present. You have to stop to be truly present. Uh, this may just be a, a very short stop, uh, uh, less than a second, just, but we do need to interrupt our, our f automatic flow of life by being present in the moment. So that's the first thing, you're present. When you're present, you can look for the opportunity that is offered you at that moment. And uh, as I say, most of the time it's the opportunity to enjoy, enjoy uh, the, the beautiful day, enjoy the person with whom you are, enjoy uh, just being able to breathe. And, uh, and, and then, uh, the third thing is to go, and that means when you have stopped and seen the opportunity, then you do something. Go means do something with this opportunity. Use the opportunity, as I say, mostly to enjoy, but sometimes to stand up and protest against something that should not be, or ask difficult questions, and that can change the world. So gratefulness is not only something that makes you happy, personally, but it is something that can truly change our society and change the world. And it's never too soon to teach children. And through this little method of stop, look, and go, you can teach children from the very start. They love to do that. <laughs> so it's, it's not unconditional acceptance of everything that life brings. It's, uh, grateful living is not unconditional acceptance at all. It's not really acceptance. Uh, gratefulness is not acceptance. Gratefulness is uh, availing yourself of the opportunity. And that of opportunity may be one to stand on your own two feet and to speak up, to be counted, and to protest. Uh, that is also an opportunity for which we must be very grateful. Mm. And to use our judgment to decide what, which is which, when it's time to say thank you and it's time to change. And if we are open to the present moment, we will know when it is time, to, what it is time to do. Uh, we need only open ourselves and look and, and be aware of the opportunity. You also speak in, this, in the same sense, you also speak in your books about the difference between prayer and prayerfulness, or living a prayerful life, uh, which I found very beautiful. Could you explain to me what, what you mean by that concept, that idea of living in continuous prayer? Yes. Uh, if we, uh, we ask ourselves, what is prayer? And prayer is communication with God, or communication uh, with uh, that mysterious love in which we are embedded in our life. That, that, uh, is uh, communication with life in all its forms in which it comes to us. And that is different from saying prayers. It is very good to have certain times in which you say prayers, whether they are set prayers or prayers that you make up. At the moment, it's good to have times for prayers uh, because uh, that reminds you, that keeps you on, on track. Uh, but it, it is really a means to an end, and the end is to be at all times prayerful, to be at all times in communication with the mystery that surrounds you, with the mystery of life in last analysis. And that means come alive and respond to life, life in all its different forms and in, in all the opportunities that life offers us. I'd like to ask you a question. We were just talking about this with Virginia before we came. Um, which is really pertaining to people who feel the devotion that you're talking about, but may not feel or may not find it so easily 
to, to establish a relationship with a divine being or to think in terms of God. What would you advise to some? Do you think it's necessary as part of a spiritual life to have a concept such as God and relate to it? Or is it enough to just be in love with the mystery? We have to distinguish between spiritual experience and the interpretation of this experience. And the, the experience is something that is shared by all human beings, but the interpretation is given to us by the particular culture and religious tradition in which we grow up. And so it makes a great difference whether somebody has this uh, experience of communion with the ultimate reality in a Buddhist context or in a Christian context or in a Hindu context makes a great difference, but the experience unites us. So the more emphasis we put on the experience and the less on the interpretation, the better it is. Uh, we, we, our spiritual traditions agree that uh, ultimately what we call God or the divine is beyond concepts, is beyond expression. We, can, we cannot really uh, put it into words. So we should take the words very lightly. We do our best, but the most important thing is the experience. And on the human level, it's an experience of love. Love in the sense of saying yes to belonging. We belong together and we say yes, not only with our mouth, but with our whole being, with, our, with the way we interact with one another with the way we treat one another with respect and, and, and uh, peacefully. I, that's, that's a very clear distinction, but on the level of the experience, people who believe tend to have a relationship, a beseeching even relationship. If, if they believe in a personal God, they would ask for things or they would plea or they would, whereas a person who doesn't would be more alone in that sense. They would not feel that somebody's, somebody's or some force is looking out for them. Is there a substantial difference between these two experiences in your concept? Yes, uh, uh, it makes a great difference in what particular tradition you stand. Uh, usually you feel most at home in the one in which you have grown up, but uh, sometimes uh, in another one. And I have uh, met people, who, many people, who came from a Jewish or a Christian background and went into Buddhist training and really found their spirituality and their response to life in the Buddhist context. And yet they will say, uh, there's still something missing. I feel something missing. I feel this personal warmth and personal relationship to the divine. Uh, I, th uh, I think, and, and then I tell them, well, you can combine it. Uh, there's no reason why you can't combine that. But uh, this relationship to the Tao, to the, what we call to the ultimate Tao, as Martin Buber calls it, the divine Tao, uh, uh, that is uh, common to all human beings. Because if you say I, uh, that implies a you. I implies a you. So in the moment in which a human being uh, becomes conscious of I, can with conscious conviction say I, it's that person is positing the you. But not necessarily a supernatural you. Uh, not necessarily a supernatural you. Well, when you very carefully let yourself down into this experience, you find that uh, without su applying such labels as natural or supernatural, you find that it is a you which is never fully, uh, uh, never fully represented by the human and, and, and animal you that use that you meet. Uh, it, it goes beyond everything. Uh, you, you, it is the you to whom you tell your story. Uh, we are alive as human beings, uh, and we can also experience that by, by paying attention to it. We live our lives 
by telling our story. We are telling somebody our story. And that is this great you. Uh, whether it's natural or supernatural, it, it is what makes me I. As the uh, poet E.E. E. Cummings says, I am through you, so I. Now we can say that to human beings, but uh, we want to tell our story to the people whom we really, really love, and we find we can't fully tell it. We tell it only to that ultimate you. Uh, I had a friend, Henry Nouwen, a good, uh, famous writer, and uh, he would uh, go on trips and take uh, uh, slides. That was the time when one didn't have these uh, cell phone cameras, but one took slides. And then when he came home, he was showing his slides. And his friends uh, would be patient and look at 30 slides, but after that they fell asleep. And so he had so many slides and he wanted to show all his trips. And he said, I know what it will be like when I get to heaven. God will say, Henry, here you are, show me your slides. <laughs> we all feel like that. We want somebody who really is interested in the story and whom we ca can tell our whole story. And uh, that is this great thou. And there are some traditions who name it and cultivate that relationship very consciously, and there are other traditions who put less emphasis on it, for instance, the Buddhist tradition. Uh, but it is there in, in our human spirituality. It's basically there with all human beings. It could be the higher self, too, in, in Jungian terms. It could, could it be the higher self, too? Could we be talking to ourselves in a way? Uh, the higher self is just another name for the same reality. Uh, the important thing is that we experience this. There is this thou. And, uh, what we, call, we certainly shouldn't, uh, when we call it the higher self, uh, we are avoiding the idea that it is some god over there. We should avoid that uh, uh, separation. If it is really divine, if it is really God in the sense in which uh, those who use the term God uh, correctly mean it, it is never separated, it's never over against us. Uh, it is, uh, yes, there is an I-thou relationship, but that is totally embedded in, in a greater rela relationship. Uh, one could, for instance, uh, speak of the divine as the source from which all things come, the giver, if you want to personify the source from which all good gifts come, source of life, uh, then the gift, and we ourselves experience ourselves as gift, and everything else is gift, and, and all people are gifts to one another, and animals and plants, and everything is gift to one another. And, and then there is the third uh, dynamic element, and that is the thanksgiving. And through thanksgiving, the gift flows back to the giver. And so there is this great stream of source and gift and thanksgiving, and this is the divine reality. So when we speak of God, we should think of something in which we are totally immersed, and yet which is infinitely uh, beyond us. Uh, the image is that of a, a vessel that is f completely filled with water and immersed in the ocean. So this is our relationship to the divine, not over against, and yet the relationship of saying you, when I say I, is embedded in that, in that relationship. In that togetherness. Mm. So we can have a personal relationship without separation. That's, that's, Distinction that's without separation. Distinct. That would unite both the Eastern and the Western way of Yes. Seeking and, the I divine. Have, I, and I have spoken to uh, Buddhists, for instance, uh, uh, in dialogues about this, this concept, and they say, well, the most important thing is the experience, but if you want to put it into words, that's okay. <laughs> They've accepted but it. what a pity that you have to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> On that we all agree. <laughs> 
I also, I, in, the, in this same sense that we're talking, I want to ask you for what your opinion of a con concrete and, and difficult example. It's an article I read once of a, a Holocaust survivor, concentration camp survivor. He said, God was not there in the camps, so we had to do his work for him. We had to tend to each other. We had to, say, to, to save, to care, to inspire each other on. I found that very difficult to read. I don't know how it strikes you, what you would say to a person saying such a thing. Well, um, for, for all of us, one doesn't even have to have uh, the extreme situation of the Holocaust or of a concentration camp. But uh, for all of us, there are periods in which uh, this divine you seems very far away and, and, and we seem and alone and, and lonely and alienated. And in those uh, situations, it is extremely important for us to be helped by other human beings. Uh, our faith, our trust in life must again and again be supported by other human beings who show us love and compassion and, and trust. Uh, our trust must be bolstered by other people's trust in us. And uh, uh, so in, in that respect, People, uh, uh, there are periods in, in, in life when we are very, when God seems absence, absent, and when our own presence and the presence of other human beings is the only way in which we can mediate that awareness of, of some divine presence. But it is always present. It's only our consciousness that it should be absent, because life itself is that mystery. So as long as we are alive. Uh, we are embedded in that mysterious reality which we call life. How do you personally deal with the harsher aspects of the mystery? For example, I'm sorry for the personal question, have you had crises of faith upon certain very inexplicable and harsh realities such as a child dying of cancer, things that have really no explanation for us? I have been very uh, blessed in this respect. I cannot remember any uh, crisis in which I was, uh, a, a, in the sense of crisis of faith, of uh, not trusting in life. Uh, but I have many situations, uh, I've had, I've suffered a lot from depression, and so I know situations in which you don't feel that trust. Uh, you know it in your head, you know it will change again, that's what I tell myself during those periods, and you know that life supports you and you can breathe deeply and experience that, uh, but uh, in the sense of distrusting that uh, I, I wouldn't even know how to express it in my own language, distrusting that God is there. If anything is there, it's God. <laughs> but how, how is God there when it, I'm sorry to insist on this, but this is the kind of thing that gets yeah, me yeah, feeling yeah. that way. When a child is stricken with a horrible disease and, and there's no explaining it and, and you, have to ex you have to live with that situation, how is God there for you in such a situation? Well, especially in situations of great difficulty, sickness of a child, or, uh, death of a friend, uh, so especially in those uh, situations, uh, we are challenged. Uh, I feel myself challenged to trust in life. This is what is, and uh, and uh, this is an opportunity for me to learn what life is really like. This is an opportunity to share great love to those who suffer. This is an opportunity to to grow. Um, by experience. And we know that uh, uh, very often through the most difficult experiences we grow the most. When we look back on our lives, some catastrophe, and that made us who we really are. So we need not uh, despair, but it's a very, very difficult situation and precisely those are the moments when we need to trust in life. We don't know how it's going to go. We are open for surprise, but we trust. Are you not stricken even intellectually by the sense of injustice? Because 
the, the people around the suffering person may go on and find some sense eventually, but that person that has to leave in such circumstances, do you, do you, are you not struck by the injustice of it? If we realize how small we are with regard to the mystery that surrounds us simply on a natural level, how unable, un, totally unable I am to digest my breakfast. I have not the slightest idea how to do it. It does itself. Life digests my breakfast. Uh, life makes m uh, my fingernails grow. Uh, life makes me breathe. I can't even breathe, stop breathing if I like to do it. We are embedded in something so much greater than we ourselves are. So to make my, when we become aware of this, it is difficult to make ourselves judge and say this should not be so and this should be so. We just look, this is, is, this is what is. It is very sad, it is very painful, but to say that life is unjust it doesn't make too much sense. <laughs> then I make myself bigger than life and I'm judging life and yet uh, I can't even live one more second without life living me. Uh, but uh, uh, often what I'm confronted with is human injustice and then that is the moment to stand up and really be counted and do something. And, and uh, that is a very different situation. I understand, and I'm, I'm sorry, I will ask just one more question about this <laughs> yeah, yeah, and not bother right. you with it anymore, but um, human injustice is easier to deal with because we all feel we can do something about that. But I, I just always wonder when a person of, of, of deep faith and f faces such a thing as a tsunami or you know these, these unexplainable situations that take the lives of thousands and, and, and nothing seems to account for it, I just wonder, intellectually speaking, even how does one just surrender thought and and, and and just not try to explain, understand it? Does just one accept life as as it is unconditionally? Uh, there are so many situations quite apart from uh, great catastrophes like the tsunami, and so there are so many other situations in which we absolutely don't understand what is going on. Uh, so we. we need to live with this real, with this realization that we do not know, we do not know. Uh, and, and that, but we also experience that uh, we can trust life, that life is trustworthy. Uh, you, you personally feel that? We can, we can live with that even in the face of such apparently terrible situations that help but we can also say, if we have the right concept of, of God, uh, that when anything suffers, not only any human, but when any little mosquito suffers, God suffers. Because everything is alive by God's own life. So it's not as if God was sitting up there completely unconcerned or un of happy and down here we suffer. This is the image that makes this so difficult to understand. Down here all these people are suffering and God is sitting somewhere up upon the couch. Well, that is a totally wrong image of God. Uh, God, when anything suffers, God suffers. And God, we are totally immersed in God and God is totally in us. When you realize that, then it's a very different attitude towards pain and, and misery in the world. You still want to change wherever you can change it for the better, but it's not that idea that an unjust God inflicts this on us. We have, to, we have been brainwashed to a certain extent in this wrong image of, of God, and we have to get rid of that, because other, that is why so many people suffer shipwreck in their faith because they, they start out with a wrong image of God. Well, with an image of an all-powerful God. An all, uh, yeah, there's this all-powerful God, uh, omnip uh, omnipotent and, and uh, knows everything from before. Why does he let this happen? Well... You don't believe in an omnipotent God? That's, that, with that God, I don't know what to do. That's just a wrong image. So to you, it's a God that's becoming with us, 
Yes. It's experiencing every moment with us. With us, in us, and we in God. And yet we can relate to God because that is also part of the whole uh, reality of the divine reality. That is very deeply embedded in the Christian teaching of the Trinity. You know? We are son or daughter, we are word of, of, that comes out of the silence. And we respond, we respond to so this uh, loving response between us and God is, in, is part of this whole uh, divine life. Mm -hmm. it's, it's within God. Within God, yeah. All, all together. We mentioned earlier uh, Joseph Campbell's work. He said also at one point that we must affirm life to the root. That is the only way to affirm life. You can't affirm it only in part what you like and what you right. don't like. Uh, and he said even in its monstrous aspect, referring to the fact that life eats life and that we have to kill to eat, even vegetables we have yeah. to kill. Um, do you agree? And he also mentioned, sorry, that um, the earliest tribes were 100% celebratory of life, their rituals, he was never able to find one that was life-denying or complained in any way, that this only came to be later when civilization developed. D do, you, do you agree with this assertion that we have to affirm life to the root? Uh, Campbell's notion that we have to affirm life to the roots comes very close to me saying mm. uh, that uh, uh, we uh, must say yes to life, we must trust life, and the giver of life, the source of life, whatever that is, it's a total mystery. Uh, when I say giver of life, I have already used an image. Uh, even source and even roots, these are all images. Uh, but we are confronted with this total mystery out of which life comes, and we are alive, and uh, uh, we trust that. And, and Campbell expresses it by saying, uh, take life to the very roots, trust life to the very roots. You also mention, um, you, you talk extensively about death in your books, which I found fascinating as part of this, this whole dance of life. And you mentioned it in relation to gratitude. I wanted to ask you about this, something about the way we live every moment by dying to the moment that, that just went before and, and, and that being an essential part of gratitude. Could you elaborate a little bit about this? Yeah. In, in a sense, uh, we, uh, uh, we live, if we live spiritual lives, if we live fully alive, we have to die every moment to what goes before, because otherwise we are not present in the, in, in the now. Uh, we let go of what was before, otherwise we are clinging to it and we are not present. So this is a kind of death. And in our last moment, we will again have to let go of what went before. And we know that whenever we let go, we go into greater life, into fuller life, into fuller awareness, and fuller aliveness. So we can trust that this will also happen when we die. We don't know much about it at all. But we know that in, in our present life, we have two levels of development. There is, on the one hand, <coughs> The, our development of, of our body in space and time. Uh, it's developing in space and time, and in that sense, development uh, is very similar to the development of a plant. Uh, it comes from a seed, it goes, it, it uh, matures, it bears fruit, and then it dies again. It, it goes out and is recycled. And so uh, I say, I have a body. All of us say, we, I have a body. And, and that body was not here some time ago, but all its, its elements were in, in some, uh, mm -hmm. invested in some other forms. And then it came together, then it lives, then it will be recycled again. That's the body I have. But that I can say, I have a body. Who is that? who has the body, it's not the body that says, I have the body. There's another reality. I am a body and I have a body. And the, the one who has the body, that's the self, that is the observer. And that self uh, is not subject to death because it has no parts, it hasn't, it's not in time and space, it, it is completely free. And when this body dies, uh, the self is not affected by it. 
uh, and what we do during our life is beautifully expressed by the poet Rilke, Rainer Maria Rilke, German poet, and he says, we are the bees of the invisible, and we, har we harvest uh, uh, the nectar of the visible in the great, into the great golden honeycomb of the invisible. And that is what we do every moment. Every moment, uh, what we experience there on the level of the uh, material of time and space uh, is harvested into the realm of memory, which is not a realm of time and space. It has traces in the brain, but that's, that's not the memory. The memory is what we experience in, in the now. And when uh, this, uh, our life is over, we uh, have a whole harvest of, uh, of memories, uh, of loving memories that can never be lost. And we, we harvest that into that great self. And we have enriched the world through our experience. Even our sufferings, our loving suffering is a wonderful harvest. It becomes very sweet and is harvested into that realm. Um, this is even without presupposing life after death, of course, because you're talking in more abstract terms. Except that I don't call it after death, because uh, death is when time is up, you see, when there's no more time. And then all that is left is the now. The now is not really in time. We think that the now is a little stretch in time. But when you look carefully, uh, it's not in time. It, it, time is in the now, because the past, when it was there, was now. The future, when it comes, will be now. So all is always now, and the now doesn't pass away. Mm. Is that what you mean when you talk about creative dying, creatively dying? I found that a very good expression. I, I, I wish we could die creatively. That would be uh, every moment creatively dying is harvesting the nectar of the visible into the golden honeycomb of the invisible. <laughs> but not everybody is able to, to let go with that kind of grace. Well, You think uh, it's because we're afraid? We can practice letting go, uh, and, but as we know, we ourselves every so often want to cling, and we have to learn it. Everybody has to learn it, but I think it's our human task to do that. Mm. Um, speaking about the w different ways of dying, there was one oriental master, I can't remember his name now, Suzuki Roshi, no it wasn't, well, he said his, he was dying of cancer and he was surrounded by his disciples and his students and they were all looking at him all the time and he said, I know what you expect, you want to see how a master dies. Well, perhaps I will die saying, no, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, <laughs> you know. He was trying to shock them out of this expectation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was struck by this story because obviously we don't know how we're going to face that know. moment. That's, that's so interesting. We have no idea. Uh, I pray for a, a gentle death. I want a gentle death. My mother had a very gentle death. Uh, I was present with her. She, she was well until the, uh, she was only 79 and she was well uh, and working uh, for the poor until uh, just a few weeks before her death, and she got a very uh, aggressive kind of leukemia. And then uh, two or three days before she died, she said, this is how I would like to die. Uh, you should sit where you are sitting now and holding my hand like you're holding it now, and I just want to go to sleep. And I said, that's very nice, but unfortunately, we can't plan it that way. And two days later, I was sitting there, I was holding her hand, and she just went to sleep. And that is the kind of death that I would like, like to have, a gentle death. A gentle death and a grateful death, yeah. right? Um, do you think we can prepare for that, if we, if we learn how to live with death in our lives? I think if we uh, train ourselves moment by moment to let go, uh, and we don't even have to think of the letting go, just to be present to whatever is offered us, the opportunity of the present moment, fully present, and that is a uh, prep, good preparation for death. That is the way in which we harvest the nectar of the visible into the honeycomb of the invisible. 
we Westerners are not very good at, at letting go. It's, it's not a practice that's been instilled into us. Um, Virginia, who, as I was telling you before, works with transpersonal psychology and with the meeting of East and West, uh, usually works with this in her, in her seminars, in her classes. Um, I don't know if you want to ask a question about yeah. this, perhaps? I have. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to ask in, in Spanish with the help of Fabiana to be more clear. Um, en Occidente eh, es común que las personas, las buenas personas, se traten muy mal a sí mismas. But in the West it's very common for people, for good people to treat themselves very badly. To speak of themselves to badly. To treat themselves badly, to not be good to themselves sentirse disconforme de sí mismos, entender que la espiritualidad es exigirse y no ser gentil. ¿Cómo ve usted esto, Brother David? She says that they demand a lot of themselves, that they think spirituality should be a difficult, demanding way of life, and just generally are not happy with themselves. How do you see this? Uh, for, in my experience, people who live that way have been uh, uh, trained as children uh, by their parents in this attitude because the parents gave them the impression you are only loved if you achieve this, you are only loved if you do this and not if you do something else. So uh, we should really start with children by giving them unconditional love and, and trust that you, you can do it, you can do it. Uh, but if People, if we meet adults who have this attitude, we have to uh, do our best. It's too late. <laughs> they are no longer the children, but we can address the child in them and we can give them great confidence. You can do it. We can look at them with the eyes of a mother that says, you can do it, you can do it. And that will help them. But we are responsible for people like that. They can't help themselves. They have been. Uh, mistreated and uh, suffering from. Desde hace casi 30 años, mi objetivo en Argentina es que la psicología se humanice y se una a la espiritualidad, considere la espiritualidad ya no como patología. Usted tiene formación en psicología en forma académica. ¿Cómo integró en su vida la psicología y la espiritualidad? Uh, what Virginia is asking is, she's been working for the past 30 years, her whole professional life, to help integrate spirituality into psychology, and for psychology to not look at spirituality in a pathological way. So she's asking, since she knows you have, you've been trained as a psychologist, and clearly you're a spiritual man, how have you worked out this conundrum? How have you integrated both of these disciplines together? Right. Well, a great uh, psychologist of uh, the our time, 20th century, uh, like Maslow and Rogers, uh, they have uh, realized that what we achieved in psychology up to now is fine. Uh, we, need, uh, we, need, we can build on it, we can take it, but it is not enough. Uh, it does not, uh, it does not uh, reach the whole human being. It is, it's too limited. And so we have to broaden it. And that is how uh, humanistic psychology came about and then transpersonal psychology came about. And uh, on, uh, all the other aspects of psychology are fine, but I think they must be built into the biggest picture that we have. Uh, and, and that is, at the present moment, transpersonal psychology. Thank you. Uh, Usted hablaba recién de la plegaria por una muerte gentil. ¿Cómo concibe usted eh, la intervención de lo invisible en los problemas humanos? ¿Es posible, es posible esa eh, ayuda del mundo invisible, de, de aquello que nos trasciende? Um, you spoke earlier of a gentle death, or the wish, or the hope, or the prayer for a gentle death. She says, is it possible for the invisible to act in our lives in, in a helping way? Do you, do you find personally that we are helped continually in our past by the invisible force that, that, that is the source of us all? 
I'm not sure that I understood the question correctly. What uh, are you asking if we can let our invisible force inform our life and flow through our life and yeah. work in our life? Uh, well, we all do that because life itself uh, is invisible. Uh, it's an invisible reality. Uh, we don't know what it is. Even science cannot tell us what life is. And yet uh, we only need to entrust ourselves uh, to life and live life fully. And that means interactively, because uh, consciousness uh, is uh, at its best when it is interactive. It is really comes to itself when it's interactive. And that is grateful living, and that is uh, availing yourself of the opportunities to interact with all other human beings and with all plants and animals and with the whole universe, that is full life. And that means acting out of a, a force that is completely uh, invisible and is completely mysterious to us, but which we know and which, which which keeps us alive, which is our very life. We often think that we have life, but we don't have life. Life has us. Yeah. Life lives it's us. True. And to live out of this, that seems to be what you have in mind. Just to elaborate on her question, I think also what she was asking, maybe I didn't put it across well, is, is it naive to expect to be helped by the unseen? Ah, I see. <coughs> I, I, it is not naive to think that we are helped by that which is totally mysterious to us because, uh, we, because first of all, it is happening every moment. Every moment our body does a thousand things that, uh, that we are not at all aware of to even keep us alive. Every second, as many, uh, I think it is something like five million red blood cells die and five million red blood cells are born every moment. Well, we have no control over that. That is something that happens simply on the physical level. Uh, so to entrust ourselves to that is not at all uh, unreasonable or naive. That is the, the normal thing that most people do, all people do. And then uh, when we have some very difficult task uh, or some decision that we have to make, we know that uh, in last analysis, even though we put a lot of thought into it, but it's an intuition that in the end uh, gives us the good solution. There was a a um, survey was made among uh, physicists and, and mathematicians uh, during, during the lifetime of Einstein still, and they asked them if they arrived at their uh, great discoveries through thinking or in some other way. And all of them, unanimously they said, the thinking was important but the insight was a gift. It was something that just came intuitively. So that would be entrusting ourselves to intuition. Uh, and sometimes when uh, there is a great danger, mothers will have uh, immediately the solution for their children. They will jump in front of a car and rescue the child with superhuman strength. And when you ask them afterwards, how did you do that? They were not thinking about it, they were not planning it, they were not deciding it. Life was doing it through them. This is not naive at all to trust in that. We see it all around us. In sus libros, eh, habla usted del pecado, noción que tortura a muchas buenas personas, eh, y esto lo he visto en terapia también. Eh, leer lo que usted dice sobre el pecado me parece eh, liberador, como que corrige la idea. ¿Podría explicarlo, por favor? 
She says that the notion of sin has tortured many good the people. The notion of? Sin, sin. Yeah. She wants to talk about sin. Has tortured many good people. And the way that you speak about sin in your books has seemed to her a, a very liberating and very unique. So she'd like you to elaborate on, on your, your idea of sin. Right. <coughs> well, from this image of a God who sits up there on some throne and is separated from us and is kind of a, a judge or a heavenly policeman or something like that. Uh, from that comes also a wrong notion of sin, uh, that, that there are some do's and don'ts, and if you do the wrong thing or do not do the right thing, then you get punished. And many people suffer very much from uh, fear uh, uh, that is engendered through these images. But if we, uh, there is certainly such a thing to which that concept of sin points. Uh, there is, uh, there are times in which we are not living up to our own integrity personally, so we know that is not right. There are times when we injure somebody uh, on, on the human level, some other person, uh, and that we know that this is not right. So we know that there is such a thing as sin, but the very word sin in English at least, not unfortunately in Spanish, but points towards s separation. Uh, sin and separation come from the same uh, root in, in, in English. So everything that separates you from your own true self and from other human beings, uh, that cuts you off, that is sin. And if it doesn't do that, it isn't sin, no matter what anybody says. But if it cuts you off from your own uh, integrity and from yeah. other people, then that is, is sin, and we have to overcome it. Uh, and we overcome it by stressing the yes to belong, by love. Sin is the opposite of love. To live, we belong together. To live as one lives when one belongs together. That is, the, that is the overcoming of sin. That is also in the New Testament. Sin, uh, uh, love blots out of all sins, overcomes all sins. My last question. Uh, usted tiene 87 años. You're uh, 87 years old? Yeah. Seven? 87. 87. Yeah. Uh, oh, <laughs> you're so young. Eh, ¿Cómo ve usted hoy el rol de la gente mayor en el cambio del mundo? Porque usted tiene muchas conferencias, muchos libros, mucho que hacer diario. Y mucha gente mayor sigue trabajando por el mundo. ¿Cómo ve usted hoy el rol de la gente mayor en el cambio del mundo? because you're still so active and so young at 87, she's asking, how do you see elders or older people's role in changing the world today? Not just in living a good life, but in actually making a difference in the world. Hmm, that's, very, that's a wonderful question. I like that. Uh, I think the most important uh, thing for older people is to love the younger ones to really appreciate the younger ones, to encourage the younger ones. Uh, we have seen a, a very different world from the world that is today. The world of my childhood was unrecognizable uh, in comparison with this world that we live in. So it's easy for older people to withdraw and to become uh, disenchanted, but we have to overcome that by really showing young people love and trust. You can do it, you can do it. Yeah. We are going into a new future. It will be totally different from anything that uh, we old ones have known, but it will be also good because life is full of surprises and we have to be open for those surprises. Sure. So I think the most important thing for old people is to love the young ones and to encourage them. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, and God bless you and your wonderful work. Thank you. Thank it's been a blessing for me too. Good.